Hey, everybody. It is such a joy to be here. And Sheila, you know, that's my home girl from North Carolina. We're grits, girls raised in the South. Uh, but Sheila, you never cease to amaze me. I'm so honored to be here. I thank you so much for inviting me. And we are so proud of you. You know, there are a lot of us watching you that you don't even know we're out there watching you. But you're doing such amazing things. I mean, just look at the, the, the sponsorship alone is amazing, just amazing. So to you, Sheila, to you. You know, uh, it's just amazing what can happen in these types of gatherings where magic can actually happen. That we're getting so fueled and so refused that so much magic can happen. I, uh, I think about what Sheila's doing, and I think about the, the story of, of little Kimmy, who's in her classroom, and she's drawing and drawing and drawing. And the teacher, you know when kids are so into their drawing, they're sticking their little tongue out, and they're all into it. So the teacher said, what in the world are you drawing, Kimmy? She said, teacher, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, now come on, Kimmy. You know you can't draw a picture of God. Nobody's drawing a picture of God. Nobody even knows what God looks like. Little Kimmy looked at the teacher and said, they gonna know in a minute. <laughs> so I think the amount of faith that we put in things. I wanna thank all of you also for showing up. There's so many things, we're all women, you know, and some, some, some of the guys in here are honorary power chicks. <laughs> but. <laughs> But there's so much more that you could have been doing and you decided to show up here. And I think that courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen as we're talking today about taking that seat at the table. Because never before, at least in my history, have I seen so much happening with women in terms of what we are doing, particularly being called to leadership positions like never before. Our divine gifts mean so much more than ever before. And those gifts are going to drag us to where we have to be. I love the encouragement of looking within yourself to determine those divine gifts. Because we don't find those answers outside of ourselves, calling somebody and asking them. You got to do the work and find it right here. And sometimes you don't even know what those gifts are yet. I mean, I think I'm the queen of reinvention. <laughs> I mean, I've done so many different things, but some of those things I never dreamed I would do. When I got my talk show, I never dreamed I would be a talk show host, but somebody offered me that opportunity and we stepped up to the game. There are times when sometimes our greatest gifts can also be what we think are our flaws. I remember when I was a little girl, they told me, you talk too much. I mean, I can't imagine anybody saying that about me, right? <laughs> but today, I'm known as a talk show host and a podcaster. They said, you're too nosy. Well, today, I'm an award-winning journalist. They said, you're too dramatic. Well, I work in Hollywood for a living now. They said, your voice it doesn't sound like a girl. It's too raspy. It's too deep. Today, I'm a voiceover artist. And they said, you're too bossy. How many of us heard that? And how many of us today are CEOs of our own companies? Yeah. So yes, indeed, sometimes our gifts, our, our flaws turn out to be our greatest gifts, and those gifts will drag us where we have to go. I don't know if it was the hashtag me movement, hashtag women's empowerment, hashtag black girl magic, hashtag whatever, I believe that started this movement, but don't you feel that it's such a continuum of what we have been doing as women fighting all along, but this time it seems that there's this unconscious call that everybody has to step up and take some form of leadership. We are women and we are definitely roaring today and the genie is out the bottle. It's not gonna go any place. And I think that this type of movement is going to call for more of us to step up. Maybe because we're so unhappy in certain things. Yeah, it's a movement that's got you can clap for yourself if you want to. Absolutely. 
Absolutely, because I do believe that even women who never thought about themselves as being leaders are being touched by this momentum. There's almost this subconscious thing going on that says, what can I do to help with this movement? I also love this movement of hashtag why not me? I am so encouraged, now listen, I said it was election day, and I said I wasn't gonna talk politics. I told Sheila, I'm not gonna mess up with your sponsors. <laughs> but I will say this, uh, and one of the stories I'm most impressed with, with with politics right now, and it's what women are doing. The 20 or more black women who were elected in Shelby County, Tennessee, an amazing story. Amazing. I'm so encouraged by that story because most of these women admitted that they, many of them had not been in politics. We're getting in politics for the first time. One as young as 27 years old. And all because they said they were sick and tired of being sick and tired. And they felt that they could do something. They could offer something. They could fix things. And yes, I was listening to one interview. They all admitted, yeah, we had to fight harder. We had to get up earlier. We had to work harder. We were competing with men, and every second we had to prove that their doubts were unfounded. But every step of the way, they say, and we're quick to point out, we had each other. The saving grace is that they all had each other. And I find that that's happening more and more across the country. This incredible tribe of women with common goals, eager and willing to lift each other up because that's what we do. We lift as we rise. As Ambassador Claire Booth Luce said, because I am a woman, I must make unusual efforts to succeed. Because if I fail, nobody's gonna say, oh, she doesn't have what it takes. They will say, women don't have what it takes. While we may be individually strong, and you know who you are, you know you're a giant wherever you walk, but I think the only things that makes that so much better is when we look at our, how powerful we are collectively and how we're even getting the support of our male allies, who I'm calling our, our honorary power chicks today. Because a feminist can be a man too. But it's a man or a woman who wants to fix something, who knows that things can be better for women, whether it's on the home front or the workplace or the judicial system or the political landscape. And because no political battle, as my mom would say, is ever won on the sidelines. We've got to roll up our sleeves and get into the throw. I remember when I wanted to be a cheerleader. I didn't want to be a majorette. I wanted to be a cheerleader. And I asked my mom, can I be a cheerleader? And she said, absolutely not. <laughs> and I said, but come on, Ma, I got a big voice. I can scream across a field. I'm really cheery. And I can, you know, and I believe in teamwork. She said, you want to bounce on the field? Get in the game. I said, get in the game? She said, and the word is get, not get, because one day you might want to get a job. Like I said, I've got to hand it to uh, our brothers who are, who are stepping up like never before in our movement. I think we're calling them our allies. It's a wonderful thing to witness, to see, and experience. I spoke with a man on my way here, and he said, you know, Rolanda, I'm going to join the Me Too movement too. And I said, you are? He said, yes, and it's not for my daughter. I'm going to join the Me Too movement for my son because we are having to re-educate our children now, to re-educate our boys, to give girls and women more respect. And I so appreciate the men who are joining that effort as well. Our movement is resounding and encouraging people all over the world. They are watching us, ladies. I was just in India a couple of weeks ago speaking at the Global Summit, and I was so impressed with the numbers of women coming up to me saying how 
encouraged and driven they are by watching what we're doing over here in America. They are hungry for our leadership, our encouragement, and ideas. And slowly but surely, there are changes happening in India where it's really tough to be a woman. We're seeing laws, they're changing. When I was there, the law had changed that um, women, you know, if a woman was caught cheating on her husband, you could be stoned to death or acided or killed. They're changing that law. Uh, I met a woman who was teaching young women how to get their driver's license so they could be independent and not have to be sold off at 12 years old by their family to survive. And so we are seeing changes, and a lot of those women said it was because of what they are watching over here. We also, as women, have such a tremendous and rich history to look at, even though it, in, it, it was a lot of pain, a lot of labor, and a lot of suffering, but our suffrage history as I might bring up on this election day. It should give us strength that is, is, it's, it, as it is an exciting story. It's a story of achievement, of ingenious strategies, outrageous tactics that were used to outwit opponents and make the most of limited resources. But all of it proves that the power of what we can do together is unlimited as female leaders, as politicians, journalists, visionaries. And I know some of y'all call yourselves rabble-rousers, troublemakers, and warriors. That's a good thing. Women who are active, who are controversial, who are passionate, these are the stars of the show today and the brightest gems of our country and the world. From the living room to the boardroom, from India to Indiana, from Burkas to Birkenstock, we are being called to step up our game and to help find solutions, to educate, not agitate, and to have strong, loud, confident voices, and to take center stage and to take that place at the table because the world desperately needs us, desperately needs our divine gifts, our divine leadership, more than ever before, and I think perhaps more than ever before, so many of us at one time are ready and able and willing for that call. Like I said, not just individually, but collectively. It's so wonderful to live at a time when women are working together. How many of us remember that time when there were so few of us, I know I was in a newsroom, wherever you were, there were so few of us that if another woman or another black woman in particular walked in, it was like, okay, who's gonna go? <laughs> you know, automatically put up the competition with us. And you know, we didn't work together. I mean, I think a lot of us remember when women didn't work together as well. But we learned that we don't do anything alone in life and certainly nothing as big as the things that we're facing right now. So I encourage you also to reach out and, and help others, like we just talked about earlier. Meet somebody that doesn't look like you. Reach out and help somebody and get to know somebody and band with somebody who has like ideas but may not be like you at all. Collectively, we will win. The tribalism movement has created teams, teams of us. And I look at team in a whole different way now. T-E-A-M, together everyone achieves more success. Because after all, we're not here to see through each other. We are here to see each other through. And, not, and, and as a nation, you know, these may be perilous times in our nation, but they're not powerless times. And I think that we together can make that tremendous difference because an empowered individual can make the impossible possible. Faye Walton says the only safe ship in a storm is leadership. And I believe that women are natural leaders. I believe there are only two kinds of people in the world, women and people who come from women. <laughs> and women, <laughs> and while we make up about 50% of the population, we can't forget that we also make up about 70% of the people who are in poverty, with two-thirds of us never being taught to read or write. 
Do you have any idea what it might be like not to be able to read? I work with literacy volunteers, and if there's something you want to do to give back, teach a woman how to read. Because if you can't read, you can't fill out a driver's license, you can't fill out a job application, you can't read a book to your child, you can't even read the label on your medicine or your child's medicine. So you are already thrust into poverty. So if you want to help, those of us at Literacy uh, Partners would love that. And remember that the children are watching what we do right now. We don't lead by titles. We lead by our example. And our future is in the faces of our children. Dr. Maya Angelou reminds us that each child belongs to all of us and they will bring us a tomorrow in direct relation to the responsibility that we have shown them. Future civilizations, in fact, are going to judge us by how we treated our children, the examples that we show, and the type of humanity that we left behind. If your actions create a legacy that inspires others to dream more, says Dolly Parton of nine to five, if you can inspire people to dream more, learn more, do more, become more, then you are an excellent leader. What does it take to be a divine leader? Much of great leadership starts from within, where we find our divine God-given gifts. The question is, how will you use those God-given gifts as if it were a gift back to God? I often say that when I go up there and meet the maker, I'm going to walk up there and go, here I am, all used up. <laughs> because I'm going to use every single thing I got to give it all back and hopefully elevate humanity as I do that as well. <laughs> Whether I'm reporting the news or I'm hosting a talk show or a podcast or I'm writing a book or taking stage or being in front of the camera, I really only do one thing. And that is that I tell stories. I'm a storyteller. It comes from my Southern heritage. It comes from my love of books. It comes from my parents and people who told me stories that affected my life and made me strong and gave me something to hold on to. Because at the end of the day, that's all we have are our stories. And so what legacy will we leave behind? I hope that my stories, as you heard me say in India, I do hope and I am proud to say that many of my stories have helped change minds and change laws and change hearts. And I hope that my divine leadership will provide a story that might touch someone and might make the world a far better place. Our divine humanity or our divine leadership is also about our divine humanity and how we treat people. As we learn, even on occasions like this, that we have so much in common. Dr. Angelo used to also say, I am human, so therefore anything human cannot be alien to me. If we just treated each other with more respect, with more kindness and compassion, we wouldn't have half the atrocities that we are facing right now on this earth. What happened to civility and politeness and kindness toward each other? As we are being leaders, let's dig out that old golden rule too. Divine leadership is only strengthened, I believe, when we also look at all of those that came before us, all of the people who fought for our right to vote, for our right to be here. Never forget that rich history. Also your ancestors. In this day and age, we have to count on everything to get us through. And many of us come from such great ancestry because don't forget, we are spiritual beings as well. So why not tap into 
that and take full advantage of all of those who have fought, died, prayed, and prepared a path just for us. Every day I wake up and I pray, God, lead me where you need me. And I swear I can hear my ancestors start crying. I can hear my ancestors singing. And Lord, let her be a leader where you need her. Everywhere I walk, whether it's in a Hollywood pitch meeting, standing on the stage before you, or walking into an audition or a new job, I always bring that power of my ancestry with me. Kumbaya, come on by here because I need you today. I call on my daddy, <laughs> Auntie Maya, all the folks gone on back that I didn't even know. I say, come on up here and be in that room before I show up, please. Get it ready for me. I bring that power with me. Ancestors who remind me that my crown and all the jewels in it have already been bought and paid for. My job is to wear that crown and to wear it well. And even when it tips a little bit, <laughs> Sheila, I just put a bobby pin in it and keep on strutting. <laughs> Reminding myself as my ancestors to remind me to not lean on anybody and only bow to God. I loved earlier as a challenge what one of our speakers was saying. If you don't like something, you don't like that boyfriend, you don't like that house, you hate that job, you don't even like, change it. Reinvent yourself. I think I'm gonna do a whole retreat on reinvention. I've done it so many times. <laughs> but it came from, from being bored. You know, I, I must admit, there are times when I have felt like, you know, I'm doing some really cool stuff, but my soul is so hungry that I know there's got to be more to life than just working. What could be worse than to spend all of your life working at something that doesn't even matter? So challenge yourself to go out there and find things that really jazz you. Because when you're happy, the money will come. When you're passionate, the followers will come. The clients will come. Dig deep and find what makes your heart soar. And be happy about that. And whatever you do with all of this leadership you're mustering up and all the great stuff you're going to get from this conference, whatever you do, don't become the world's best kept secret. You don't serve anybody by not letting your divinity shine. Now, I know I'm bold. Very little embarrasses me. But a lot of people are very shy. But now is not the time to keep who you are secret because we need you. So dare to take the center stage. Dare to take the seat at that table. And don't let your divine leadership die inside of you. A leader takes people where they want to go, says Rosalind Carter. But a great leader takes people where they don't necessarily want to go, but ought to be. I often quote Dr. Maya Angelou because... She was my Auntie Maya, very close family friend for many years. And she was always, as I was a young woman coming up, she was always there for me, making sure I was going to be a strong woman and all of the rest. She always encouraged anyone to always try to be a rainbow in somebody's cloud. And I know indeed that she believed that women are the rainbows in so many clouds. During the meanest and the toughest and the cruelest, most threatening times of life when hope seems dim, be that rainbow in your sister's cloud. Black, white, what auntie would say, black and white, fat and skinny, pretty and not so pretty, straight and gay, Christian, Muslim and Jew, women, are the rainbows in the clouds. 
So be a profound and phenomenal rainbow woman. Be beautiful to yourself first and then to anybody else who has the luxury to see you. <laughs> Work deeply on yourself. Understand the practice that if you want the world to be better, it has to start with you. The higher you elevate your own positivity, the better you clear your mind of negativity, expand your dreams, your imagination, your mind, reinvent yourself, getting out of your own sit. I said sit. <laughs> because a lot of us get very complacent and comfortable. So get on up and as we learned earlier today, start moving, even if you turn a quarter in one place. And stay away from negative people. Negative people, naysayers, will bring you down faster than anything else. Many of us know people who are so negative they can walk in a dark room and develop a picture. <laughs> stay away from those people. And you know what? And sometimes you're the negative person talking to yourself. I mean, I, when, was, when you walked in that mirror this morning, you went, ugh. You know, with the th there, 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 there are times I can say things to myself. I would slap somebody who said that to somebody else, you know? So watch that too, because we can be our own worst enemies. The bottom line is, take center stage in your own life and take that seat at the table that Sheila is talking about. Take it. It's your movie, and this is not a dress rehearsal. You are the CEO of your own life, and there's something in you right now that is longing to break out, determined to be free, ready to get out there and shine and strut its stuff for the world to see. As I said, your gifts are going to drag you where you're supposed to be. And for many of us, it's to shine as leaders. The question isn't, who's going to let me? The question today is, who's going to stop me? So take on this challenge that Sheila and all of us are demanding of each other this beautiful couple of days, and take it with full throttled intention, integrity, dignity, and of course, a lot of style. Be unstoppable. I want to just end with this one affirmation. I love Shad Helmstetter. If you're looking for great affirmations, you will just love this guy. And I love this affirmation. I want to share it with you as I close. If I want to make something of myself, it's up to me. It's not other people's doubts that count. It's my belief in me. It's not the challenges I face each day. It's my determination to overcome them. It's not the lack of opportunities in front of me. It's my willingness to find them. My success is not up to the world around me or up to someone else. My success is up to me. No excuses. Be unstoppable, ladies. And thank you so much for the opportunity to spend this time with you. We love you, Sheila. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And y'all tune into my podcast for more talk. RolandaOnDemand.com. <laughs>